Hello, everybody. Let's talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. For those of you guys who do not know me, and for those of you who do, I apologize that I always introduce myself, but YouTube cuts views and also uh, demonetizes and also cuts the the recommendations to my channel. So I, I look at the statistics and the majority of the people watching these videos are people who are new to the platform, or at least my platform, rather. But I studied in Israel and the Palestinian areas. I lived there. And in addition, my goal is to get my PhD studying security. So when we dive into this type of stuff, I really want to focus on the deep, kind of more abstract type of questions, bigger, deeper seated stuff. But essentially, what I really wanted to skim over, just to just to kind of give a little background about the situation, was what happened recently, the United States' role, the ceasefire, the law that allows all this horrible, just heinous, flamboyantly shafting type of shit to go on, and then I kind of abstract questions that you guys have asked me that I want to directly answer. And then also, where do we go from here? I think I'm going to do this more like a podcasting set where it's just, I kind of just ramble. And the reason for that is because I'm traveling a lot, especially for education. I'm getting everything ready for the upcoming school year. And so as a result, I don't have a lot of time to edit. So I'm like, screw it. I'm just going to turn this bad bitch into a podcast and I'm just going to do like no editing and, <laughs> and see all the stupid shit I say. But let's find out. Timestamps in the description box as well as sources. If this is YouTube and Rockfan, if it's television, sorry, that's just the way it got to be. So if you hear me ramble and you want to skip ahead, that's that's what you got to do. Anyway, how did it, how did this situation happen? Well, obviously, I'm going to butcher the holy corral out of these names, so bear with me. But there's a place called Sheikh Jarrah. It's in East Jerusalem. Palestinians were kicked out of their homes. Jewish settlers were moving into their homes. There is a law that was passed that had allowed this to happen. I will get into that law later. It's kind of a detailed shit, so I just want to... Go over the Twitter version real quick. So that pissed off the Palestinians. From that point, the Palestinians had protested. Israelis, go figure, had cracked down on said protest. Then the Israeli government, specifically the IDF, had this beautiful idea of like, how do we make the worst mistake possible and piss off the Palestinians and essentially piss in their third most holiest spot in the entire world? Well... They decided to bust into the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is the third most holiest site in Islam. They did it during Ramadan, which is one of the most holiest of times of their entire year. And on top of that, they did this as a response to protests. Because apparently the people inside Al-Aqsa Mosque were doing something wrong that had required an infiltration and observation because there was protests going on in that general area, which were brutally cracked down on. So that started the fighting that we know now. There's over, uh, I think it was last I checked, 213 or so deaths, about 63-ish kids on the Palestinian side were killed. In terms of Israelis, it's about 10 Israelis and two Israeli kids that were killed. So obviously the, the attacks were disproportional. And also we have to dive in deeper to the question of, Okay, are the Palestinians claiming defense? Because personally, yes, yes, they're defending themselves because they can't peacefully protest. And I will get into that. They've been cracked down on many, many, many times over. They can't peacefully protest. So if you can't peacefully protest, how are you going to respond? They're getting evicted in a genocide right now. And I will get into this. Okay, so I'm going to keep my shit together in the meantime. The United States' role is what really pisses me off here. Our role in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is about as toxic as Flint, Michigan's water. The Biden administration said, hold my beer, IDF. I'm going to go ahead and fan the flames even more. Okay. If Israel was our friend and our friend was an alcoholic, we're giving them Everclear. The Biden administration said, how do I stark and sow the seeds of conflict even more? I'm going to give the Israeli military $735 million in weapons. $735 million. That doesn't seem like you're trying to support peace. Now, does it? Especially when these are the individuals who had originally started the conflict. On top of that, the rest of the international community said, hold on a second here, U.S. It seems like you have your head in the sand pit full of hell. Maybe we shouldn't do this and let's have a U.N. resolution to be able to stop them. Well, the United States said, hold my secondary beer, son. I don't think so. The United States is on the Security Council permanently. 
What that means is that the United States can veto any UN resolution that it sees fit for the rest of eternity. And I mean like literally, literally that's what it is. It was created after World War II. It was created to get the all the countries to, to come together and to form some sort of a union. They couldn't get the most powerful countries together unless they had some sort of advantage over the smaller countries, thus creating the Security Council. There are some members that kind of rotate through, so like they're only on there for a certain amount of time, but there are some that are inevitably there forever, like the United States. So the United States says, you know what? I, I don't think so, son. We're going to go ahead and veto this three times in a week. And the response to this was that the United States said, well, we're, we're, we're working on a situation with the Palestine, or excuse me, the Israeli government to be able to stop the conflict where we have this, this whole idea behind the scenes that we're going to work on in order to help the situation. Well, their masterminded idea was for Biden. And I don't mean to do low blows, but let's be real here. I'm not sure if he even remembered that he was making the call in real time, but Maybe that was a low blow. I'm gonna, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that for the rest of the podcast. I don't want that to delegitimize my, the rest of what I'm saying. <laughs> but Biden talked to Netanyahu, and he had said uh, that Netanyahu should have a ceasefire with the Palestinians. However, if the ceasefire does not happen, that the United States is not going to be responding in any sort of retaliatory way against the Palestinians, or excuse me, the Israelis. So the Israeli government can take it or leave it, and that's it, done. I know there's going to be people to say, well, there is a ceasefire. Ah, well, it's, it's, ceasefire is a loose term, especially when there isn't really a ceasefire going on. But anyway, to further put the U.S.'s role into perspective, in 2019, we gave $3.3 billion to Israel, and this is according to USA, the official U.S. body, the governmental body. In addition to that, while everybody's waiting for their stimulus checks in 2020, the U.S. government decided to still give $5.3 million to the Israeli government. So we're all waiting for our stimulus checks, and they're like, hey, Israel, here you go. And they just sprinkle it all in there. Isn't that kind of a slap to the face, right? By the way, I'm still stuck on this analogy I said earlier. Flint, Flint Michigan still doesn't have water. So, like, what could that have done for them, right? On top of all this stuff... Pro-Israel individuals and organizations gave $33 million in election campaign donations in 2020. Biden got $3.2 million of that. It's not really any sort of surprise as to why Biden's taking the stance that he is. So now see, there's now a ceasefire, air quote ceasefire, where Egypt is act, acting like the, the helpful, helpful mentor to a child with two abusive American and Israeli parents. That's essentially what we're what's happening. Hours after the ceasefire had happened, Israeli forces cracked down on the Palestinians in Jerusalem and decided to break up their celebrations for the ceasefire. Essentially, it was a, it was a prayer circle and celebrations that there's a ceasefire. The Israeli military decided to crack down on that. However, I will be fair here. I do not know why there was a crackdown just yet. So I'm going to kind of tell you that this was the situation. And I'm going to leave it at that. We haven't gotten any details like why was this a crackdown? Why did this happen? Look, we can all take our guesses. I'm trying to be as objective as possible. I think that there is probably a crackdown because the Israeli government still wanted to control the area, even though there was a ceasefire. And I mean, militaristically control the area. But I'm going to leave it at that. Bear with me here. I'm going to chug some coffee real quick. I'm going to try to stay away from the camera or the microphone when I do this. I don't want you guys to get any weird ASMR crap. So how did this all start? Why did this happen? Well, there was a law that was passed. And here, essentially, here's the Israeli settlement law summarized. So if you sold your house before 1948, thus giving up your ownership, you can reclaim ownership and kick out the current owners who are always Palestinian. And always, I'm using that as a rough term, but 99.99% of the time, it's Palestinian. Palestinians originally fled to Sheikh Jarrah, the town where displacements are currently happening, because they, the 700,000 Palestinians who were forced out of their homes during the creation of Israel, they fled to Sheikh Jarrah because they had nowhere else to go, because they were forcibly removed from their towns. Sheikh Jarrah turned into one of the only living centers for current Palestine. To put this all in analogy, 
the Israelis were like, hey, son, guess what? We're making a state. You need a Kentucky Fried, get the fuck out of this place. So they, they got up, forcibly evicted and massacred thousands of people. 750,000 Palestinians fled. A lot of them went to Jordan, which, by the way, Jordan took over a part of the Palestinian land. So it's like they, they took over Jordan. Is, uh, the Palestinians fled to Jordan, but also fled back to some of their land. They had nowhere else to go. So they went to Sheikh Jarrah. And now the Israelis said, hey, we want this land as well. By the way, there's also this individual. His name is Arya King. He is the deputy mayor of Jerusalem. Now, he was actually a guy who was laughing at one of the political activists at the in the area. Um, I think his name was Mohammed Hummus. I apologize if I'm missing another uh, a name or I'm butchering his name in any sort of way. I'm just coming up with this off the top of my head. But I'll have sources here if you're watching this. But if you're listening to the story, essentially, this deputy mayor was laughing at this guy for getting shot and said that he should have gotten shot in the head instead. And this was an, also an individual who had worked with U.S. nonprofits in order to raise money to put Israeli settlers, excuse me, Jewish settlers, inside of these towns where Palestinians are forcibly evicted. So the landlords all got together and said, look, we don't want Palestinians to live here. With the law, they took over the land again, and then they forcibly evicted these Palestinians. Okay. The United States, by the way, gives like $220 million to Israeli settlements through nonprofits. Just a little fun fact for you guys. And this individual, Arya King, even said that his goal is to establish more of a Israeli Jewish land in that particular area. So a lot of the people who are taking up this guy's offer are people from the United States. There's even a viral video, by the way, of a guy from New York who decided to come in and kick a Palestinian family out. Technically, it was the landlord kicked the Palestinian family out, and then he moved in. And so there's these people who are the elderly, 80 years old, lived in that house the whole life. They're kicked out because some dude from New York wants to live there. Jacob, you know this is not your house. Yes, but if I go, you don't go back. So what's the problem? Why are you yelling at me? I didn't do this. I didn't do this. But well, you're you're you're... It's easy to yell at me, but I didn't do this. The other aspect of this that I want to mention is that so far, even with the ceasefire, it does not appear the Palestinians get their homes back after the ceasefire. So the people who were forcibly evicted to begin with, they're not going to get their homes back. Okay, that's what started the conflict. So far, they're not going to get their homes back. So does this ceasefire lead to long-term peace and stability? Well, no, there's still people who are forcibly evicted. These, this isn't, a, this isn't, this isn't any sort of remedy. What it is, is it's an international gaslighting towards the Palestinian people. It's a concept that originates from this idea that because there was a genocide against the Jewish people, which was horrible and one of the worst things that humanity has ever done and experienced, that somehow that justifies what is currently coming into another genocide. You have to realize that I believe it's uh, 90, over 90%, I believe it's 93% of the Palestinian water over there is undrinkable. Palestinian territory is the densest populated areas in the world and one of the most impoverished areas in the world. Okay, let's just keep that in mind. So for everybody who thinks that the Palestinians do not deserve to uprise or resist, they should probably stop staring at a wall, like Andrew Yang, by the way, who made these comments about Hamas terrorists and how he stands with Israel, which I'm not a Hamas supporter, don't get me wrong. However, it is important to remember that these issues between the Israelis and Palestinians had gone on for 30, 40 years before the creation of Hamas had even started, okay? So let's take Hamas out of the circle for a second, and let's have a deeper and broader perspective and understanding about the situation that we're currently dealing with. Let's get into the questions that people have for me. So these are questions, again, that people ask me on Twitter. So I was like, okay, cool. Hey, everybody asked me some questions that you want to know. I don't really want to keep covering the news all the time because it's boring as hell and everybody already knows what's going on. So here's the first question. Netanyahu has been prime minister since long before I was ever politically aware. How bad was the conflict and oppression of Palestinians before him? Well, I mean, it's been going on forever. The creation of Israel started in 1948. The expulsion of the Palestinians started in, in 1947, which, by the way, there was no war. 
That's a lie. There was no war between the Israelis and the Palestinians. The Israelis, this actually, fun fact, this is according to the Israeli military's historical archives, by the way. They systematically went into each Palestinian village, recognized the leader, killed the leader, and forcibly evicted these individuals or killing them. And they kept their houses intact so the Israeli settlers could move into that area, or the Jewish settlers, rather, because Israel is not created till the year after. But without ranting too much, yes, these things have happened before. There's something known as Sharon's Walk, where this Israeli prime minister, or one of the individuals running for prime minister, Sharon, he decided to bring about 100 guards and walk to Islam's third most holy site, Al-Aqsa Mosque. He walked up to it and he said, Israel will own this mosque. Imagine for a second that you're the one who is impoverished and you're the one dealing with all the shit. And you got this guy walking around like an asshat Maximus, okay, a Kentucky Fry. I don't know why I keep saying Kentucky Fry, but I just think it's so funny to me. A Kentucky Fried head, okay, a fucking Dingle Dorcas 5000 walking up and starting and essentially starting a war right there on the spot. That's a clear sign of provocation. Whether you support the Israelis or Palestinians, we should all agree with that. Or else you're literally not paying attention. You're watching paint dry like Andrew Yang. Another thing that happened was this guy named, uh, I think it's Rabin. Again, I apologize if I'm butchering the name just out of respect for culture. It's R-A-B-I-N. He was the Israeli defense minister and also turned into the Israeli's uh, prime minister. But he supported something called the broken bones policy. Essentially, during the first intifada, meaning uprising, back in the 80s, he said that Israeli military will go into the deserts, grab Palestinians, literally break their bones with rocks. And they did. They did. They literally put Palestinians' arms behind their backs, straighten out their elbows, grab the boulder, snap their arm in half. These are things that have already happened. Broke their shoulders, broke their ribs. These are things that you can look up. These are verifiably concrete things that an individual who isn't staring into the sun, like Andrew Yang, can clearly find. So yeah, these things have happened all of the time. And I'm, I'm saying this not yelling at this individual because I actually, I've talked to this person, very cool. I'm saying this because I'm pissed at the fact that this happens. Next question, why do nations who claim to respect human rights continue to do business with a state that practices apartheid, ethnic cleansing, and genocide by systemic attrition and trauma? So why do nations claim to respect human rights? Well, obviously it's all for show. I don't need to say that. We all know that. Most of the which, most of these things that you're seeing is all economic, I would say. most For the most part, Israel has a greater economic impact on the world than the Palestinian areas, unfortunately. And so a lot of countries decide to side with Israel in order to strengthen that economic ties and also look better in the international community. And then the countries who should be resist, well, I mean, we should all be resisting what's going on with the Palestinians, but the countries in the Middle East specifically will still do business with the rest of the world. And so the key with diplomacy, and this has happened obviously throughout the test of time, is in order to legitimize an economic cause, what you decide to do is to legitimize it with commonly held beliefs, thus being the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I hope I answered that question. The next one, the root cause of this problem between them? Question mark. I assume you mean recently, because obviously the root cause has to stem all the way back to the creation of, of Israel. But the recent cause, like I had mentioned, was obviously because of the settlers in Sheikh Jarrah and the law that Israel just passed, and the difference between, in 1940, I believe it was 19, yeah, 1947, the UN partition plan between the Israelis and the Palestinians. There is a whole gaggle of people, believe it or not. They all, between the Palestinians, Israelis, the United States, the United Nations, they all gathered together in a cluster and all agreed, this is Israel, this is Palestine. These things have already been agreed. However, in the years to follow, Israel decided to occupy more land, particularly in the Six-Day War in 1967, which, by the way, was kind of bullshit in of itself. I hate to say it. Sorry, but it's true. The Six-Day War was when countries were, quote-unquote, trying to invade Israel. Lebanon, Jordan, the Palestinian areas, and Egypt. In reality, it was actually a ragtag group of volunteers who were attacking Israel along the outskirts, and then Israel essentially just beat everybody's ass. 
However, that wasn't like the militaries were uniting. It wasn't even the militaries themselves. It was just a group of volunteers who wanted to try to make a difference. And that's pretty much that. Jordan didn't even want to participate in that. As a matter of fact, Jordan had a deal with the Israeli government to ensure that they're not going to participate. And in, re in response, they get land. So hopefully that answers that. Next question. Why do you think no one will help the Palestinians? North Korea, Russia, China, Syria, Iran. Why is Russia and Syria but not Palestine? Actually, I do have an answer for that. Specifically with Russia. So Russia actually has about 330,000 Russians in Israel, in Israel, um, especially in a location called Chad Hashrom, which I used to live around. Um, but the Russians, after the fall of the Soviet Union, there is kind of like kind of a, essentially there's a lot of crap going on, as you can imagine. And so as a result, a lot of them went and sought refuge in Israel. And so there's no way that Russia is going to go against Israel because Russia... Israel came to Russia's aid, and there's a lot of Russians in there. It's kind of like why Americans aren't going to go against Israel because there's a lot of Israelis or there's a lot of uh, people adhere to the laws of Judaism inside the United States. Same thing. North Korea, I think they're dealing with their own problems. Iran actually is allegedly helping the Palestinian areas. Um, Syria, that's I'm not really sure. To be honest, I haven't looked into Syria too much. Next, can you explain about situations like the AP building that was destroyed? Is Israel largely entirely, or excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm going to repeat that whole thing. I butchered the holy hell out of that. Can you explain about situations like the AP building that was destroyed? Is Israel lying entirely when they say Hamas was there? Um, yeah, I'm going to read the uh, Associated Press's message on this. Here's a tweet. Breaking, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken says he has not seen any Israeli evidence of Hamas operating in Gaza office building that Israel destroyed in an airstrike. The building housed the Associated Press, broadcaster Al Jazeera, and other media. So was Hamas there? I strongly doubt it. And also, if they're quote-unquote trying to kill a Hamas official there, they gave everybody about an hour warning ahead of time that this was going to happen. And so why exactly were they trying to do this? And Israel has a, a history of targeting media officials as well. Fun fact. Does, so the only other thing I can think about is like, does Hamas have a massive base underneath the AP building where they could blow up all of that technology? No, I strongly, strongly doubt that. There's no evidence to indicate that other than what the IDF might say, which the IDF has a history about lying, especially with things like this. So let's see, uh, what was the message Israel was trying to send? Why would they destroy foreign media offices? Well, the message was to not film there and to be careful about what you say. There's even situations where, fun fact for you, Human Rights Watch had even gone in into Israel during the Second Intifada or Second Uprising between 2000 and 2005. They told the IDF where they're going to be, specific building. They received clearance to be in that area, and they had reminded Israel, the IDF specifically, that they're going to be there seven different times and they still got bombed. Human Rights Watch got bombed. This is a consistent thing. Fun fact. Oh, by the way, also, there's also many, many reports that Human Rights Watch had reported on that showed that the IDF was using Palestinians as shields against the Palestinians themselves. Fun fact. Oh, also, there's this concept going on around uh, Palestinians who are currently using like women as shields. There's one of these specific situations that are going around. It's a viral video that the IDF was using where this woman was like, I am a human shield. They actually cut that out. They, they butchered that clip. What the woman was saying is, I feel like a human shield as a medic covering the injured while I'm helping them. But anyway, last question here. It says, have you felt a shift in public perception in the last two weeks compared to earlier flare-ups? Yes, I absolutely have. I think that People are understanding a lot more about the Palestinian cause because they're seeing Israel's overt aggression. I think that's that's changing in the U.S., though I think in Europe, I think that that's not the case. I'm pretty sure in Europe, they're becoming more pro-Israel and the U.S. is becoming more pro-Palestinian. I can't exactly account for why that is right now. Do, I think it's probably because of the, the increased aggression on the side of the left, like myself, being like, hey, no, 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 you guys are wrong. You guys are wrong. Look at the reality of the situation. And I think that that's now finally rubbing off. Do you think we could reach a tipping point? I don't think so. Are we on the verge of the end of Israel? No. 
or is this the latest slaughter just like all the previous ones? I think it's pretty similar. I think the thing that we should all kind of hold on to is the fact that Israel is, how do I put this? Israel is being held accountable more so now, and I think that's going to be a trend that's going to continue. So in that respect, yes, I do think something will change. Will it change their exact policies right now? No, I do not. Also, I apologize right now if you're watching this. The sun, because I'm using the sun, is shafting the holy bejesus out of this camera, so it's getting real dark here and there. So sorry about that. What do I think the solution is? Okay, this is like... We're, we have like a fortune cookie of just hell that feels like we're getting hit with a, sn a sack full of snack packs. And we're trying to figure out how are we going to fix any of this? Because talking about it's one thing, but we need to have a solution. Well, one idea is this two-state solution, obviously. There was somebody named Kyle Kalinske of a, a YouTube channel called Secular Talk who had said that he doesn't believe that an apartheid or excuse me, Israel is an apartheid state like South Africa. He doesn't know if a two-state solution would ever be possible. Personally, I'm kind of balancing in between the idea of, of forcing Israel's hand back to the agreement in 1947, which, by the way, the Palestinians had already, and specifically around the uh, early to mid-2000s, had actually already agreed to Israeli conditions for a peace settlement to have a two-state solution and Israel had declined their own negotiation. So Israel said, this is our, this is what we stand for. This is what we want. The Palestinians said, cool, and still didn't happen. I think the best way to do this is to incorporate the Palestinians into the Israeli uh, country and give them voting rights. I think that they should become Israeli citizens. Do I think that that is going to happen with the current Israeli government, not in 100 years. Netanyahu is an individual who doesn't even support the two-state solution. He's on record back in the 80s saying these things. But I think this is the only option, kind of like South Africa. I think that option would be achieved faster than a two-state solution. However, as like a, a white dude who's from the U.S., I'm trying to take a step out of that aspect and be like, okay, Palestinians, what do you, how, how do you think you should do this? Because you live there. I'm just a dude spectating on the side right i don't want to be some sort of like larper who's pretending to be somebody who has lived there forever and all this other stuff right i want to talk to them about this how do they think this will go do they do they even want to have citizenship and rights inside of israel granted israel's going to try to die before that because that if palestinians were incorporated there would be more muslims inside of israel and israel would not be a jewish state anymore but i don't agree with having religious states to begin with like a theocracy, I don't really agree with that to begin with because you're going to have inherent uh, discrepancies and discrimination like we are seeing right now. Yeah, other than that, other than two-state solution and this solution, there's BDS, boycott, divest, and sanction. Right now, there's 35 states that are trying to crack down on that because it's so effective. For people who don't know what I'm talking about, what it is is you boycott, divest, and sanction companies that do work with Israel while they are occupying Palestinian areas. And before Fox News picks up clips like this and be like, look, they're just trying to destroy and hate Israel. No, 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 no. They had an agreement in 1947 that they are going, they're, we all had an agreement. 1947, these are your lines, these are my lines, and guess what? You crossed that line many, 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 many years ago. You crossed it. You crossed it. You crossed it. So while they're occupying, we're going to boycott, divest, and sanction companies that do work with Israel. However, there's these like state politicians that are saying, well, no, you can't do that because that correlates to anti-Semitism. It's like, mother Israel does not define Judaism. Zionism in Israel is its own thing, okay? That's its own thing. You cannot support a genocide this is like being not this isn't similar this isn't completely similar but this is like back in the day with some of the old the old uh colonizing days being like oh if you if you don't buy british products then you're anti-british no we just don't support the invasion of africa like what the f are you talking about but this is the type of narrative that's spun now this is the reality of the situation 
I hope I answered some things and I'm not just just uh, talking into the void. I hope you guys have gotten some stuff out of this. If you guys want a summary also, I just started TikTok, which by the way, does not like ban this channel like YouTube does because YouTube, excuse me, YouTube sent me a message telling me that they stopped recommending my channel and started cutting my views. So most of this stuff that I get that gets over a couple thousand views will get cut down to 30 views. TikTok doesn't do that. I'm gonna review some footage and I might add some TikToks as summaries at the end of this just for fun, but I'll see if the audio gets like destroyed and blown out and and just turns into straight hell. I don't really know. But if this is the last you hear of me right now, thank you very much. I I think that we're in a step with the right direction with the Palestinians. I just wish it was faster. I definitely wish it was faster. But my TikTok is uh, the Zach Moss Show, or you could look up Zach Moss 6. Either way, thank you very much.